So um, yeah, thank you so much for inviting me uh, today um, to talk about bioinformatics. So um, I thought maybe I should share a little bit about myself before we start. So I am from Portugal, um, like you may have guessed <laughs> from the initial conversation. Um, I'm actually from um, close to the coast. Uh, so yeah, kind of a, a fishing village. Um, close to the coast, and I studied um, biological engineering in Lisbon. Um, I did um, my uh, master thesis in a basically biomedical research institute also in Lisbon, and I moved here to Cologne um, um, for my PhD, where I am essentially in my final year of the PhD in CCAD Research Center. Um, so for today, uh, I didn't really know um, what were the backgrounds of everybody that was going to join. So I tried to make it as you know broadly accessible as possible. So I want to introduce bioinformatics. I want to talk a little bit about high throughput RNA sequencing, which is essentially the data that I work with and um, tell you a little bit about this data, um, particularities of the data, so the distribution, for instance, and common problems that people have and common analysis that people do to them, to this data. Um, yeah, so as Kazima was saying, if you have any question during uh, the whole presentation, just um, feel free to interrupt and, uh, and ask, because I think it becomes um, a bit more interactive and, um, um, easy to follow for you as well. So let's start with the beginning. What is bioinformatics? Um, I really like this definition uh, that is computer-aided biology. So it's, it's still biology. Um, you work with biological data. You, uh, in the end, want to learn more about biology. So you want to gain some insight about biological knowledge. You just use computational tools to do it. So instead of you know, having a white lab coat and pipetting stuff uh, from one flask to the other in the lab, uh, you sit at your desk and you write some scripts, preferably in R, and um, that's basically how you obtain your biological knowledge. So in the end, it is biology. Informatics is kind of a tool. Um, so I wanted to illustrate this with an example that I, uh, I think you don't really need a lot of biological knowledge to understand. So this is part of work done by Kermani and colleagues in 2018. And um, what it did was to uh, collect uh, chest x-ray images from people uh, with healthy lungs, uh, with pneumonia, from bacterial origin and from viral origin and learn and train uh, um, basically a deep neural network that would be able to predict for new x-rays coming, uh, whether um, you know, the patient that these x-rays were taken from um, had pneumonia or not, and if yes, or whether it was a bacterial or viral origin. Um, so this is a very you know, medical and applied uh, case. So you start with some medical imaging data, um, and the goal here was to basically aid in medical diagnosis, so basically help the radiologists and the doctors to um, make more clear diagnosis, more correct. Um, but of course, you can work with a lot of different types of data. So for instance, you can work with uh, structural data, so structure of biomolecules inside the cell. You can work with high throughput sequencing data, which I will talk about more today. Um, the tools that you can apply to this data are also you know, a lot. Um, you can use, for instance, tree-based methods, uh, random forest, um, decision trees, of course, linear regression, linear modeling, um, essentially, practically any of your favorite you know, methods um, that you can think of, um, probably they have been applied to some sort of biological data to get some sort of biological insight. And the questions um, or goals of uh, bioinformatic analysis are sometimes, yes, so basically more applied to medicine, for instance, helping medical diagnosis or um, develop some pharmaceutical drugs uh, to cure a certain disease. But sometimes it's also more fundamental biology. So for instance, there is, you know, the same way we point 
telescopes at the stars. We also point our microscopes at the cells because there's still so much that we don't understand about our own, well, the biology of our own body and uh, how everything functions. Um, that there is still a lot of um, essentially questions left unanswered there. Um, and of course, also something really interesting um, uh, is how exactly diseases arise. So um, not only how um, your cells and your body is supposed to function in healthy conditions, but also how it goes wrong and what exactly goes wrong during disease and how you can prevent it. Um, so what does a bioinformatician do? On one hand, a bioinformatician can develop their own software and they're basically the novelty of the work or the, the, the contribution that the bioinformatician has is to create this software. Um, so it can be, for instance, a method that nobody has applied yet, or at least not as well, um, uh, to a specific type of biological data, um, or it can be um, a way of analyzing, you know, a new type of data that comes up. Um, it can be several different things. So you can develop your own software or you can apply previously developed software to answer particular questions and um, basically tweak it to your own specific data. So here um, you're not really developing. So what exactly are you doing? You know, you do a PhD for four years. What exactly are you doing for four years if not developing software? You're kind of understanding the data. Um, you are... Um, applying some of the you know common analysis pipelines or uh, software that other people have developed um, you are checking how this behaves in your data if something goes wrong if not um, and based on this you refine the pipeline after your first findings and after you explore the data um, and basically you come up with your own custom you know sequence of different software that you can apply to the data so I don't know how um, common this is to other fields, maybe it is, um, but this is essentially what a bioinformatician do. So many uh, or three different disciplines come into play. Um, one of them is, of course, biology. So it is important to understand how the data was generated. The, uh, if you're looking at particular biomolecules, um, what you're looking at and understanding their composition and everything. Uh, understanding also the biological question that you are looking at or trying to answer. But you also need a lot of, or at least some um, knowledge in, in mathematics and statistics um, um, in order to, um, to apply the right method and in the right way to your data. And of course, also computer science for like um, making these things happen in the day-to-day -day life. So basically scripting and uh, uh, yeah, writing your analysis in scripts, maybe uh, if you work with really big data, um, parallelizing it over computing nodes, um, sort of different things. Um, I cannot, was that a question? Yes, that was yeah. a question. Actually. <laughs> <laughs> I just, because I have it on speaker mode, I don't see what everyone else is doing. So <laughs> I didn't really know what was the best time to no. up. So I was just wondering, what is a software for you? Because like for me, that mm. would be an R package, for instance. Exactly. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. That's cool. Because for, like for my PhD, like, I mean, I work with our projects and I developed my own R package, but it was more of a helper tool than like the, I mean, it was more of a, like the package that I developed, it was more of um, a way to like kind of visualize the data and get some gaps out of the data and these things, but it was not mm. like the cornerstone of my entire PhD project. You know what I mean? And mm -hmm. I realized like working now in industry, working with packages and developing like and, and understanding each project as its own package is really, really common. And I was just wondering if, if this is, how you're approaching the whole like PhD project as well. Mm -hmm. I see, I see your point. Um, yeah, no, um, I think when, when I think about uh, software, I think exactly what you thought before as well uh, of an R package. 
Mm-hmm. Um, sometimes, uh, I mean, R is definitely a language that is really used in bioinformatics or, or Python also, but uh, also R a lot. Um, but there can be, for instance, um, you know, command line applications that mm-hmm. you run as well. Um, for instance, if you don't really need a lot of um, 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 interactive, mm-hmm. you know, um, visualization of the data and these kind of things, you can also run it from the uh, from the command line. And there, I would also refer to it as software as well. Absolutely. But yeah, yeah. It's basically just like one, yeah, like one R package, one you know block that does something um mm-hmm. yeah that's cool yeah that's cool. <laughs> <laughs> and, and do you publish them i because i saw on the next slide there's bioconductor do you put them up there um sometimes yes so um yeah i, I can maybe move there so yeah. for bioconductor i think it's important that uh for instance it's novel enough and generalizable so for instance if i am um uh kind of tweaking a little bit uh, my own data and the arguments of other packages to create my own custom pipeline, then this is not publishable as a package or uh, in any way. Basically, then kind of the main product is, uh, you know, your finding, essentially, the biological finding, let's say. Um, but um, if in the, in the way, as you were saying, for your own um, experience during your PhD, if on the way of, you know, answering whatever question you have, you end up creating something that you think is generally applicable to for other people, for other types of data or other data sets, even if it's the same uh, type, um, then I think it would be um, reasonable and a good idea to publish it as uh, our package. Absolutely, absolutely, totally makes sense. <laughs> Thank you. <Cool. laughs> yeah, so Bioconductor. A Bioconductor is essentially a repository, like CRUN, um, a, um, a repository of our packages, except that it's focused on bioinformatics. Um, so there is basically a very general, um, yeah, a common theme to all of these packages. Um, here, uh, the last update, <laughs> that I did to this figure was in 2020, but um, you can see basically the um, the increase of the number of software packages that were published in Bioconductor or released in Bioconductor. Um, so there are two releases per year. Uh, so two releases of Bioconductor per um, R release. And by now, 2022, we are uh, clearly over 2,000 packages. So it's really something that is widely used in the community, in the bioinformatics community, for sure. Um, and yeah, in a similar way to CRAN, it's open source. So basically, I can see um, the code of any R package that I use from Bioconductor, uh, the source code. Um, it's open development. So if I want, or uh, as Cosimo was discussing as well, um, we can develop our own packages and submit them. Uh, we don't have to be part of the you know, core team of Bioconductor or anything. Um, it is uh, supposed to be, and it is made sure that it is well documented so that uh, you know, people can download it and, um, and use it um, easily. Um, sometimes you have vignettes, uh, I think almost always you have vignettes um, explaining essentially how to integrate the package in the normal analysis. Um, there is a review process for, for these packages, so basically um, the core team tries to make sure that um, the package follows, you know, the good practice um, uh, conventions or guidelines that it's properly documented, that it's properly tested, all these things. Um, and it, again, um, the idea is basically that um, everybody has a common platform. So for instance, if I need to do uh, a linear model, I don't have to implement the linear model myself because <laughs> that would be a huge waste of time. Um, and also that if I do a given analysis with one of the packages, I just have to say, to other bioinformaticians what package I use and what version with what arguments and they can completely um, replicate my analysis, which is of course very important. Yeah, so I hope um, that 
this gives uh, what? is there a question <laughs> yes there is one <laughs> sorry <laughs> no that's actually a really cool one because um i was asking myself the same thing so Ruth asks whether there is any particular advantage to publishing to Bioconductor vis-a-vis -vis CRAN. Because like what I've heard is like the review process is really rigorous on Bioconductor. And I mm -hmm. experienced it as being okay on CRAN, for instance, but probably you can shed more light on that. So I think in Bioconductor you have, um, it is a bit more rigorous. I think I never published to CRAN. Um, so I, I don't know from experience, but I do think it is a bit more rigorous. Um, I think the main um, advantage that you have is that uh, people that use Bioconductor, they know uh, that it's bioinformatics. So basically you, you have your you know, target audience uh, more well-defined. And um, I mean, if you publish something that cannot really be applied outside of the context of biological data, then of course you should... Uh, publish it to CRAN, um, but in general, um, Bioconductor is kind of a more niche repository, and I think that's probably the main advantage. Mm -hmm. And it's probably more like the experts reviewing your code and your 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 package, so that like kind of to make mm -hmm. sure that you don't break anything that could be. I don't know like how, how the review process on Bioconductor is, but I guess on CRAN it's mainly like looking for, for general setting and like whether it works across different platforms and these things. So it's not really like mm -hmm. a code review per se, but if we assume that it was more rigorous there and possibly also some parts of a code review, this would mm -hmm. kind of like at least for me explain why Bioconductor I mean, yeah. it, it's great to have it, but I just remember like I was doing survival analysis in my PhD and I was using a package on Bioconductor and installing it was a nightmare because it no. just didn't work. And I was like, <laughs> come on, everyone uses survival analysis, not only like biological students and so on. And yeah. I was like, why can't you put it on CRAN? And then like a bit later, it, it turned like it, it ended up or it's, there was a similar package on CRAN and it made things so easy. <laughs> Yeah, so um, I think by now they facilitated a lot installation. Before oh, okay. it was not as uh, straightforward. <laughs> you had to source some script and whatever. But yeah, I but I think you make a really good point, actually. And I I'm glad you said so, um, because I was recalling my experience with Bioconductor. And for instance, uh, precisely because it's more niche than the reviewers, for instance, know that, um, let's say, in the field of single cell RNA sequencing data, you know, like one type of biological data, um, there are certain um, data types or are data structures that uh, are specific to certain packages, but these packages are so widely used that, for instance, one of the um, comments that I got or the requests that I got to change in the code in the code was to um, make it um, uh, so basically accept inputs in the format that these packages also used so that um, there is more interoperability between the uh, structure yeah data structure or data types um, between the different packages and I guess this is something that you know if um, if you are in a wider space like CRAN, the reviewer would probably not have this kind of insight of, you know, what people use in the field uh, in order to come up with this comment. And it, I guess it is a good comment because then it facilitates usage for the users as well. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. Yeah, makes total sense. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for the question. Um, okay. So I think... Um, by now we have, uh, I hope, <laughs> we have a good overview of what is bioinformatics. So I would kind of jump into the high throughput sequencing data that um, I want to um, talk about during the rest of the presentation. So if you have any more questions about the bioinformatics part, I think it's a great um, time to ask them. But if not, then I'll just go on. So I'm assuming not everybody here has a biological background. So I will do my best to explain this in you know understandable terms. And if you have questions, please ask them. Um, of course. So first of all, if your body is composed of 
many cells. And um, each of these cells carries all the information that is required to, well, create your body and maintain it. Um, and this information, which I'm calling uh, genetic information in the slide, um, is carried by wait, a macromolecule called the DNA, which you can see here. So there are two things here that I want to talk about. First, what is DNA? And second, how does it encode genetic information? How does one you know, molecule um, carry instructions on how to you know, make and maintain a body? Um, so first, what is DNA? As I said, it is a macromolecule that is actually extremely long. Um, so DNA is packed inside a compartment of the cell that is called the nucleus um, into these structures that are chromosomes. So basically X-shaped structures, maybe you've seen them before, even if you're not from biology. Um, so you kind of have this um, a double helix structure that is composed by um, two strands of DNA. Um, um, basically, yeah, coiling into this double helix structure, and these strands are joined by physical chemical interactions that keep this, uh, you know, structure basically together. Um, each strand is composed of a sequence of uh, units, which you can see here, um, that are called the bases. Um, there are four different bases, which correspond to slightly different chemical molecules uh, represented by different letters. So. Uh, a, T, G, and C. Um, and then essentially chromosomes, you can think of them as extremely, extremely long sequences of combinations of these four letters. So the same way, you know, a word is a combination of the letters in our alphabet. You can also think of, uh, you know, DNA information or genetic information as an extremely long combination um, of, of these four letters that are the genetic alphabet. Um, okay, um, so one way of representing uh, DNA or a DNA strand is basically by referring to it by the bases that compose it, and here I am representing only one of the strands because um, due to the fact that these have to be, you know, chemically bound, um, you, if you know one of the strands, you know uh, immediately what is on the other. So for instance, A and T bind together, but A does not bind with the other three, and G and C bind together, but um, they don't bind to the other two. So basically, if you know that in one of the strands you have an A, you know that on the other you have a T and so on and so forth. So basically, just knowing one of the strands is enough to know both. So now comes the second question. How does it encode, how does the DNA encode uh, genetic information? Um, here I'm representing DNA as, you know, this long sequence of bases. Um, and in it, you have particular um, parts um, um, that are called genes. Uh, so these are kind of the building blocks of the information um, of the genetic information, if you want to call it that way, in very, very simplified terms. I'm sorry to the biologists. <laughs> this is, yeah, very simplified. Um, so the idea is that this gene, um, you can think of the DNA as kind of, you know, the cookbook. Um, and the gene is where you can find a recipe for a specific meal that you want. And then the idea is that, you know, you go to this cookbook, you copy out the recipe that you want in particular for another um, molecule, a temporary one um, that we call the RNA. And then with this recipe, you essentially create um, the protein, um, uh, which is yet another molecule. So why do you need this RNA step? Because DNA is extremely you know, important, um, should not be treated lightly, let's say. Uh, or damaged in any way. So basically, you know, the, the working um, molecule would be the RNA. Um, and uh, this is then converted into a protein, which um, uh, many people would say is kind of the important molecule. So proteins, all these molecules play an important role, but proteins are essentially the effector molecules in the cells. So for instance, 
um, different proteins can, you know, come together and, uh, for instance, mediate the whole procedure that it takes to generate energy from a sugar molecule inside your cell. So, um, yeah, they are kind of the effect of molecules inside your cell. Now, the cool thing is that just because genes exist, it doesn't mean that they necessarily have to be, um, you know, transcribed into RNA and then translated into a protein. So let's look at the last case that I showed you. you we had a gene, in this case, a yellow gene, um, and some RNA was created from it. And based on this RNA, then uh, it is translated into a protein. And then this protein does something in the cell. Um, you can have, for instance, another case of, a, in this case, a green gene that is absolutely not um, uh, accessed. So there is no RNA produced from it and also no protein. And for instance, um, another gene yet, an orange gene, uh, from which several different uh, molecules, more molecules than the yellow ones are produced, and then more proteins of um, the orange type are, um, are produced. So basically the amount of, uh, you know, product, uh, either RNA or protein that is produced from a gene is referred to as um, its expression. Um, and so basically you would say, for instance, the green gene is not expressed. Uh, the yellow gene is, I don't know, somewhat expressed. The orange gene is highly expressed. Um, and um, here, uh, the regulation of which genes are expressed is extremely important because it essentially regulates what kind of proteins and how many of those you will have in the cell. So, um, for instance, we can, if we look at cells in the heart, maybe they need um, a bit of this yellow protein, maybe they need a lot of this orange protein, let's say this protein is, for instance, helping, you know, muscle contraction, uh, that the heart needs to pump blood to the um, organism or the body. Um, but for instance, if you're in the lung, then maybe you don't really need so much pumping anymore. So you would want to make less proteins of the orange type because you don't really want to waste your resources on that. Um, but uh, you would, for instance, now need the green protein. Let's say this is some protein. I'm just making it up, of course, but this is some protein involved in, I don't know, production of the mucus that keeps your um, lungs um, wet for, uh, for the oxygen transfer. Um, so basically, this tells us that um, in order to affect different functions, cells need different protein contents, and these can be translated into different RNA contents. And so looking at the content um, in terms of RNA or protein of a cell tells us essentially what it's doing. Um, so in this case, we are working with healthy conditions, what a heart cell does versus what a lung cell does, but we can also think in terms of disease, um, how does one cell respond to um, disease, for instance. Um, so here the proteins are the main effectors, as I said before, but the problem is that they're um, hard to, um, you know, capture and sequence. It's, it's hard to... Uh, to have a um, um, global quantification of uh, how much of each type of protein exists in the cell. Whereas for RNA, we have the right technologies to do so in kind of cheap ways. So this is why um, um, people usually go for the RNA instead of the proteins. But this brings us to RNA sequence. And to just keep in mind that gene expression tells us about cellular activity, and this is basically why we want to know how much of each RNA there is in each you know, cell or some. Okay, so coming to RNA sequencing data. Um, so we have really a lot of genes. Uh, so in the case of humans, we have uh, over 20,000 genes that encode for proteins, and even more that don't. I will not go into that. 
So of course we cannot evaluate each gene individually. We need a scalable method and we need to do so for you know, all of uh, basically the RNA species that are inside, um, inside a, a cell or inside a, a tissue. So um, that's what RNA sequencing does. So here I'm showing you the whole you know, kind of uh, pipeline um, of RNA sequencing. So you start with the sample you extract the RNA from the sample. So for instance, you have to um, uh, separate the cells from each other, open them, all of these things. Um, you extract the RNA, then this RNA is fragmented. So basically all of this happened in the lab. Uh, this RNA is fragmented um, and then uh, it goes through basically this sequencing step where um, well, in, in an easy way, um, you only, or you're basically trying to know what is the um, sequence code of each of these fragments. So basically you have a fragment and then you associate a sequence to it, a sequence of these four bases that I was telling you about before. Um, and then the question is, okay, uh, I have these, ba these um, um, uh, these sequences, I we call them reads. Um, I want to know from which genes these reads come from, so that you know I can say, okay, this is a fragment that comes from an, an RNA that belongs to or was a product of the uh, yellow gene, um, or this fragment comes from um, uh, an RNA which is a product of the orange gene. And for this. Um, you need to essentially align these sequences to the genome. And um, here, the, uh, one thing to keep in mind is that we know uh, the sequence of the genome for many organisms. Um, humans are one of them. So there is essentially a reference to which you can try to map um, this, uh, this small sequence or this small um, reads. Um, so in this case, they are really small um, and the genome is quite large. So it could happen that you have more than one place where this particular sequence happens. But, um, you know, in, uh, as I said, this is a scheme. So in real RNA sequencing uh, life, um, these sequences are actually, I don't know, like 200 uh, bases long. Um, so you can, um, find the exact place where they come from in the genome. And then you say, okay, um, uh, for instance, three of the reads that I found come from um, this yellow gene. I didn't find any reads coming from the green gene. And I found you know, seven reads coming from um, this orange gene. And basically then this is summarized for all of the genes uh, um, uh, in your DNA, so you know, <laughs> two thousand plus, and in the end, you get what we call count reads, which is essentially just that: how many counts um, you find from each gene. Okay, so um, one of the most popular applications of RNA sequencing then is comparison between sample groups. So let's say you have a question, which is what distinguishes, you know, old hearts from, oh, sorry, from young hearts, I uh, have it on the slides. Um, and in that case, you would basically repeat the same procedure here, or you would do this kind of pipeline just um, with many samples here. So samples from old hearts, samples from young hearts, and then you would um, kind of get a, a quantification of um, the RNA products that you have um, in all of these samples, um, which is I'm representing here. Um, so basically then uh, you would, um, this is normally, you know, in R represented as a matrix where you have, you know, your samples in columns, three, let's say young hearts, um, young heart samples and old heart samples, um, and your genes uh, correspond to the rows of this matrix. So then uh, here, um, each number would correspond to how many reads you find in that particular sample from that particular gene. Um, are there any questions so far? I think there's no question in the chat, but I think it's really fascinating. 
like to learn about it that way and then <laughs> like because it's so much like text analysis where you count words but like a bit different right mm -hmm. and it's all so similar and it's 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 funny to kind of see how things converge so thanks yeah. for sharing that <laughs> <laughs> that's really cool yeah yeah there are many um I mean, it's, I'm not really in the genome part, I'm more in the RNA part, uh, so I, I'm not really like the expert to tell you about it, but um, there are many algorithms that are really cool to basically try to map these short sequences to the big reference sequence, and um, yeah, <laughs> these are really cool. Um, okay, so yeah, essentially um, then um, uh, in this kind of experiment or when you have this kind of questions, what you usually work with your biological data is a matrix of, you know, uh, what we call counts, um, counts of reads coming from each gene in each of the sample that you look at. Um, but, uh, and then what you're looking for is, for instance, um, particular genes uh, where you find way more reads in one of the conditions compared to the other. So for instance, if you know that there is one gene that has way more RNAs in the old sample, then you can think, okay, maybe this has something to do with, uh, or if this is uh, somehow involved in, you know, heart aging, uh, could it have something to do with, um, I don't know, these age-related diseases that people have in their hearts? Um, can we develop some pharmaceutical drug to try to target um, these um, um, or cure? these diseases. So of course, this is many, many steps down the road, but that's kind of like what you dream of when you do this kind of um, analysis. Um, however, there are many things that you need to take into account um, before you do this basically um, mean in these samples versus mean in that sample. So one of the things is the effect of the total number of reads. Of course, the number of reads that you assign to one gene depends on the total number of reads that you get from one sample. So that's what I'm trying to show here. So um, I'm sorry for having everything um, at the same time in the slide, but just focus on this kind of left-hand part. I'm trying to represent the number of reads by basically the, you know, the length um, of these bars where each you know, individual bar corresponds to one individual gene. Again, a simplification, we have you know, many dozens of thousands of these. Um, and um, what I mean by total number of reads is essentially the sum of you know, the length of this full bar, the sum of all the lengths. So the sum of all the reads across all the genes. And of course, it, I mean, it's just a scaling um, um, effect, right? If you sequence um, more in one sample compared to another, even if you know you have exactly the same um, relative abundance of RNAs in the original sample, you will end up finding a lot more of everything in the second sample. And if you don't correct for this, then you could mistakenly say, oh, okay, in this sample, I find way more of the first gene, so this must mean something. So you kind of have to correct for that in a way. Um, here on the right-hand side, I'm just showing this effect over several samples. So this is a toy data set with young and old hearts, but instead of six samples here, I have 30. Um, and each point is a sample. Um, the y-axis corresponds to the genes, to the reads for one particular gene, I'm just calling it gene A, um, and the x-axis corresponds to the total number of reads, so basically the sum um, of this, um, you know, whole bar, but for the whole transcriptome, uh, for all the genes that are detected, so you see it's, you know, a very big number. And you can see a correlation here, as, you know, you would have obviously expect, um, so this is really something that you need to correct for. And the simple solution, of course, or yeah, um, is to scale by the total um, number of reads that you get. So basically you scale each of these, um, you know, little bars by the length of the total bar. And then in the end, for instance, it would look like this. And um, in this case, after doing that procedure, you would be able to say, oh, actually, all of the genes were in the same, you know, relative abundance in both samples. Um, so there is really uh, not a big difference in terms of what the cell is doing. 
Um, another effect that is good to take into account is the effect of confounding variables. So confounding variables are anything that may be a source of variation in the data beyond the biologically interesting signal. In this case, the biologically interesting signal is age, right? So old versus young. Um, but let's say, um, you know, in order to get these samples, you recruited people and they signed up, um, uh, you know, to be organ donors. Um, and you have two different, you know, origins of organ donors, for instance. Um, and uh, one is, uh, I'm calling cohort one, and the other I'm calling cohort two. Um, and this is something that um, is also very, you know, um, uh, mixed together with the H signal. So if you would compare young samples versus old samples, a part of the differences that you would see would actually be coming from differences between these two cohorts. So you, before you want to make any statement about differences between old and young, you need to remove the differences coming from the two cohorts. And this is something you can see um, really nicely in a PCA analysis. So uh, if, if you're not familiar with PCA analysis, I can totally explain it. Um, but yeah, essentially it's a dimension reduction uh, technique where um, the idea is that each point corresponds to a sample and the closer together they are in this PC space, the more similar the samples are in terms of you know um, quantities of the different RNAs or expression of the different genes. Um, and you, if I color the points by um, which cohort they come from, you see that actually, you know, in, in already in the first two PCs, you see a really good separation or somewhat good separation uh, between these two cohorts. So this is definitely having an impact on the um, um, on the data that you have. Uh, so you would need to fix this or to remove this impact somehow. And um, a way that is, um, I think, commonly done in the field is to essentially regress it out. So um, you you kind of do a linear regression um, with your um, gene expression levels, so these uh, read counts, as um, your dependent variable, um, and to a, a dummy variable encoding the cohort as your explanatory or independent variable. And then you basically look at the residuals of this. And when you look at the residuals, um, it's gone. Um, but the separation between these two cohorts is gone. Um, so after all these corrections, probably what you're really interested in is to look at genes or try to identify genes that are um, expressed at different levels between the samples. So um, what I was saying a bit before, um, genes, for instance, uh, clearly more expressed in the old hearts might be somehow related to heart aging and tell us a bit more about why um, uh, older people get, um, you know, uh, more easily these um, heart diseases. And here, um, what you care about is basically statistically quantifying the expression differences that you see between these two groups. So you have you want to find um, genes that have a different expression between the groups, um, while taking into account also the variance within the group, right? Um, and this is where basically the data distribution has to come in. Um, so normally, for this type of thing, you could do a t-test, right? Uh, but the data is definitely not normally distributed. So here I am showing um, just a density plot of um, the reads for each, uh, um, for an example gene that is lowly expressed and another example gene that is highly expressed across all the 30 samples that um, we have in this um, example data set. Um, so you see, of course, here the, the values of reads are much lower because this is a lowly expressed. We have less RNAs in this sample. Um, and here you, we have more RNAs. We find more reads coming from this gene. But here the point is this does not follow a normal distribution at all. Um, and, uh, you know, people have... Uh, try to essentially model this data and try to understand um, 
what kind of distribution it follows. And um, uh, it was found out that it follows a negative binomial distribution. Um, so this is essentially how we how we model this data. So you cannot really use, um, for instance, linear models. You would have to use generalized linear models. Yeah. Um, so for instance, then when you would do a differential expression analysis, which is the type of analysis that you do when you're looking for um, genes that are expressed at different levels between um, uh, two groups of samples, um, you would model um, the data as a negative binomial, and um, you would, um, uh, you would, for instance, look at the effect of this um, biological effect. And you can also basically um, uh, do the step that I described before of taking the confounding effects into account and do basically both at once in the same linear model. Um, and then you get um, basically a slope that tells you, a slope for this linear regression that tells you um, um, how big the differences between these two groups are. And that's essentially what you look at then um, when you do differential expression analysis. And that's what you try to see whether it's you know, significantly different from zero or not. Um, yeah, so. Um, I don't really want to go into a lot of detail about all of the, you know, uh, different things that you can do with um, RNA sequencing data. So I think I would finish here um, and maybe summarize um, um, these take home messages that I hope I could pass on to you. So we have bioinformatics as kind of computer aided biology. So in the end, it's still biology. You just use informatics tools to do it. Um, you can think of gene expression as kind of a readout of cellular activity, and you can then go into, um, you can basically look for uh, the quantities of these uh, RNAs or the expression levels of these genes um, as a way to understand what's going on in the cell um, and also um, how it reacts to diseases or to aging or whatever you want. And I hope I could um, also show you some of the features of RNA sequencing that you need to take into account um, when doing your analysis. So I think with that, I would stop and yeah, open the floor to the remaining question and answer session.